Welcome to Introduction and Overview of Epidemiology. This is part of the Master of Science course, Principles of Epidemiology. It follows along with our text, Chapter 1 and Chapter 19, as well as our supplemental text, Chapter 1, The History of Epidemiology. So let's take a look at a short video that introduces us to these concepts of public health and societal health. short video that'll introduce us to infectious diseases and the changes that occurred over time that we tend to forget the effects of things like polio smallpox on a population.
what's really surprising about measles that you'll learn in this class is that it's 99% preventable with the appropriate vaccine. And yet, um, a few years ago, about four years ago, there was a huge outbreak in California, kind of publicized by Disneyland, um, that was brought primarily into the country by people who were traveling here uh, from abroad. And this brings into the, the limelight, or at least into your awareness about herd immunity and the problems with um, lack of adequate vaccines across a population and how the most susceptible um, become infected and sometimes um, die from these uh, diseases that can be almost completely eradicated because of the successful vaccines. Mosquitoes are probably our most deadliest of transmitters of diseases that we currently have in the world. Some people believe that vaccines are dangerous and they may be dangerous to some individuals with certain types of allergies, but the risks of not being vaccinated far outnumber the risks of being vaccinated. So those two videos serve as an introduction to epidemiology. So for this lecture, I'm just going to provide a brief description of what epidemiology is and the purpose of epidemiology research, some hi historical context as how epidemiology was used in the investigation primarily in the beginning of time in public health and how it leads to the creation of programs and policies. And then, of course, it's been expanded into medical situations as well as, in medical situations, I mean studies of different types of um, therapeutic drugs as well as um, being used for research in different techniques to help people recover or prevent disease as opposed to studying disease in a population, these being two completely separate things. And occupational epidemiology is brought into it in our major approaches. So this is an introduction to get you familiar with the words of epidemiology and how it's related to um, public health, societal health, and of course, occupational safety and health. So this slide is just an example of some words that we'll talk about. And what I've found with epidemiology is that there are lots of definitions of words that can be quite uh, 
confusing, not when you hear them in context, but when you go back and you try to complete a homework assignment or take an exam or understand a research paper, you may get lost in the words of prevalence or incidence or probability or proportions or epidemic related to endemic. And I find it very useful and students who do so tend to uh, perform better if they keep a list and highlight words that are new to them so they can quickly go back and reference them. So epidemiology is <clears throat> quite literally the study of what is upon the people. So that's what epidemiology means. So we do in this class talk a lot about disease, especially common diseases such as measles or smallpox, because we can all relate to them. But also things that are upon the people can be such events as uh, disasters, changes in um, temperature extremes, maybe an earthquake, that type of un pleasurable event can be upon a population. Or maybe what's upon a population is something on the other side. Something is more positive, such as an increase in um, your expected life expectancy. This can also be um, what is upon the people. So remember that epidemiology is literally the study of what is upon the people. It's not the study of animal populations. It's not the study of um, disease markers or toxicology in animals that can later lead to um, clinical trials on humans. It is the study of disease or the prevention of disease on humans. Epidemiology is a science that studies the patterns, causes, and effects of health and disease conditions in a defined population. That's also another really important word in epidemiology, understanding your population and the sample for which a study was conducted upon, because you know you can't study everybody. It is the cornerstone of public health and in some regards occupational health and informs policy decisions based on evidence-based practices by identifying, <clears throat> by identifying risk factors for disease and targeting preventative care that can reach the largest proportion of people this population-based study. Epidemiologists help to design studies and collect data using statistical analysis. So you'll brush up on your statistics here if you haven't had statistics in a while. And it's used in clinical research as well as just basic research um, descriptive studies. So the major areas of epidemiology occur the etiology of disease, outbreak investigations, such as a whole bunch of people who got sick because they ate turkey at the Christmas dinner, um, disease surveillance, screening for diseases, screening for those um, factors which may be likely to lead somebody to developing a disease, such as having um, high blood pressure may lead you to heart disease. It may not, but it may, so you're screened for it. Um, biomarkers or biomonitoring in the body to see when a certain level of a toxin causes a disease. And these comparisons of treatment effects in clinical trials to see whether um, using a drug actually increases the life expectancy or helps people recover from a disease at a rate that's worth the risks of taking it. Um, epidemiologists, of course, rely on other sciences such as biology and toxicology. So what ep epidemiology is not. This is an important characteristic and I believe it is one of your homework questions where you have to go through and I give you some examples of studies that have been done and you will determine whether they're epidemiology, epidemiological studies or not. So they are not studies on animal populations. So the effects of a, an Ebola vaccine on monkeys, would, although that may benefit humans, it's not a study on humans and therefore it wouldn't be. Um, it's also a collection of studies. So a single case of a woman cured of HIV from an experimental vaccine 
would not be an epidemiological study. We need a preponderance of evidence. Um, so a single event, man contracts Ebola from a chicken, would not be an epidemiology study. And if you're looking for a bioassay for breast cancer, although the study is on humans, the bioassay would not be something that would be related to um, the study of what is upon the people. So these are examples of what is not related to um, the study of epidemiology. So epidemiology is, are these epidemiology studies? Case studies of a single worker exposed to sodium cyanide during the China explosion cleanup. Effects of distributing bike helmets to rural Montana school children, K through six. Biomarkers for histoplasmosis, which is a disease you get um, from bird animal droppings. Back pain among warehouse workers in North Carolina. So um, the case study, no. The effects of bike helmets, yes. Biomarkers for histoplasmosis, no. Back pain among warehouse workers, yes. So are there two broad categories of epidemiological study? There's descriptive studies and there's analytical studies. So we're going to break these down, and I'm going to talk about our descriptive studies first. In epidemiology, we're always trying to put <clears throat> the disease or the event, right? Children being hit by buses when they're crossing the street because the crosswalk isn't well marked. This would be an event of unfavorable outcome on the population. Or is it the um, incidence of gonorrhea on the Montana Tech campus. This is also something that we may study. Epidemiological studies are always considering person. What's the population that's being studied? The demographics of that population. The place. Well, where is it occurring specifically? Across the entire United States or in Butte, Montana? And also the time. Is it a single point in time or a period in time? So these concepts of person, place, and time are important when we're looking at both analytical studies, but more so descriptive studies, descriptive epidemiology studies. So in our example here, head injury fatalities by cause, you can see that firearms, vehicle accidents, other falls, and kills are the proportion of people who are dying from fatal causes and of head injuries. But what our graph does not tell us of who are these people who are dying? Are they all people or are they just teenagers? It doesn't tell us our place. Is this across the entire United States or in Sheridan, Montana? And it also doesn't tell us our time. Are we talking about the summertime, the winter time, or a decade? So our graph here tells us very little about head injury fatalities by cause because the person, place, and time are not delineated very quickly. So this is just a brief introduction. We'll go through this in much more detail in some of our other material, but one type of descriptive study is a case control study. In a case control study from your source population, people are selected by their disease state. So if you have the disease, you're put in one category. If you don't have the disease, you're put in another category. And then retrospectively, we recreate your exposure to see who had what risk factors. So this is usually our case control studies are retrospective. We put people in groups, you already have the disease or you don't have the disease, and they retrospectively study. We study backwards, different types of methods, different um, validity and accuracy problems with them, just to give you an idea of what a case control study is. This is different than an empirical study or a randomized trial, but although we're using the same terminology here. Our 
Our cohort study is another time of descriptive study. In our cohort study, we take individuals and we categorize them by their exposure to a risk factor. You ride a bicycle, you don't ride a bicycle. And then we typically follow these people forward in time to see whether they develop the disease. You have a head injury um, because you didn't wear a helmet when you were riding a bike, or you um, don't have a head injury because you were wearing a helmet when you were riding a bike. So cohorts are a group of people that are categorized by their risk factors or categorized by their exposure state, and then they're followed forward, and we wait to see whether the disease occurs. Now there's different nuances, but just so you get the general idea of grouping people by disease state or grouping people by exposure, and do we recreate their exposure through historical records, or do we follow them forward? Cohort studies tend to be quite powerful if they're done well, although they can be quite expensive, very large cohort studies. An analytical study or an intervention study uses the same terminology as we did of our case control study, but the difference is, is it's randomized. You're randomly put into the control group, which means you will not receive the new drug, or you're randomly put into the case group which means you will receive the new drug. And then we follow you forward to see whether it decreased the likelihood that you developed cancer. Or we randomly put you into a group of individuals who receive new training on preventing the development of HIV. So we have all of you, you are all my cohort. Half of you receive training on prevention of HIV, the other half do not. The people that receive the training are the cases. The people that don't receive the training are the controls. And then we follow you along to see whether there's a difference in the outcome between the people who receive the training and the people that don't receive the training. The most common way in which this is used and that you can understand it is a clinical trial where you have a group of people that say have heart disease one group is given a new drug and the other group is given sugar water. We follow them over time to see if the outcome of developing heart disease is significantly less in the group that received the drug versus the group that did not receive the drug. So the difference between our descriptive studies and our analytical, analytical studies is the control that we have in randomizing who gets what treatment and also the control in following people over a period of time and evaluating one particular risk factor or risk factors without a lot of confounders. So some different subcategories of epidemiology. So we divide this further into occupational epidemiology, something that Roger Jensen studied when he was at NIOSH injury epidemiology, environmental epidemiology, nutritional epidemiology, cancer epidemiology. We're going to focus mostly on this class using the terms in uh, public health and occupational epidemiology as well as environmental epidemiology. So what is occupational epidemiology? The study of the health effects of um, a disease or injury and the factors for which people are exposed to and they have that disease. So for example, folks who were exposed to asbestos may develop mesothelium. They may not, but they may. People who are exposed to benzene have a higher likelihood of developing leukemia. Is this a causal relationship or is it just a relationship occurred because of time passage. And then some of our emerging trends that we're looking at are um, nanotechnology and some of the effects of tiny particles getting into the bloodstream or deep in the lungs, the effects of shift work and cancer, the effects of sedentary work and obesity. 
So different types of factors that you may not think about are these chemical factors as well. Radiation, mechanical energy, force, posture, biological, and other factors may be preventative. So um, people who were exposed to asbestos and worked out, did working out lessen their likelihood of developing mesothelioma versus somebody who was exposed to asbestos and smoked cigarettes, and it increased the likelihood of them developing mesothelioma. So what is the purpose of epidemiology inquiry? Why do we do studies on humans? Well, there's a unique contribution of epidemiology to understanding human disease because it is conducted on um, humans. And although we're not really conducting research on humans, we're researching their risk factors and their exposures. And this can be done somewhat ethically, where we can expose somebody to smallpox and see what happens. But yet we can study what happens when we expose them to a vaccine or realize how different time, place, or person characteristics leads to the development of a disease or leads to a treatment. So Gordis discusses five um, basic purposes. The first one is to explain the etiology of a disease or a group of diseases by combining epidemiology data with other forms of data. So toxicology, which we're used to in occupational, in occupational <clears throat> studies, biochemistry, microbiology, and genetics. So epidemiology helps to add to that preponderance of research that there is some form of cause and effect relationship or that somebody's exposure is likely to cause a certain disease or that a protective mechanism, wearing a respirator, actually makes a difference. So this is an example from an ergonomic context where the evidence for the causal relationship between exposure to physical workplace risk factors was well cited in the epidemiology research. And you can see there's strong evidence, strong epidemiology evidence along with the biomechanical evidence that posture causes problems in the shoulder neck and forceful movements causes problem in the back, but yet pretty weak evidence that vibration causes shoulder and neck problems. So there's some evidence, but not a lot. So epidemiology helps to build that body of evidence. It certainly isn't the end all. And one of the reasons behind <clears throat> why some people doubt or don't completely support epidemiology in being an important science is that there's lots of ways in which um, error and bias can be introduced into a study, especially when you're retrospectively trying to recreate somebody's exposure. An example of a retrospective recreation of your exposure is, what did you have for lunch three days ago? Well, if you can't remember clearly, how can we determine if your lunch at Hardy's caused you to develop salmonella or not? It's really hard to go back in time. And there's also reporting biases. People that have a certain disease might report out in a different way. But other purposes of epidemiology, the one that's used probably most significantly and that we'll take a look at in this case, in this um, class, is to determine the extent of the disease found in a community. How widespread is it? Is it growing? Is it decreasing? Are our public health policies, our respirator policies, our hearing protection policies really making a difference? And so we use epidemiology tools to be able to make that determination. So epidemiologists, just like safety and health professionals, look at the five W's. Um, the health event is the what, the person is the who, the place is the where, the when is the time, and the cause are the risk factors and the modes of transmission are the why or the how. <clears throat> so we're taking that 
event, a disease, the head injury, the loss of an arm, and we're breaking it down into our who, our where, our when, our risk factors, our why, and our how, our modes of transmission, and we're studying all these together. So an example of studying the extent of a disease <clears throat> on a population, um, who is developing HIV? Where is it occurring? And what's the time period that's, that this is occurring in? So the date of the source isn't listed, so we don't know the time period, but we know um, the how it's being contaminated, the use of contaminated needles, the number of people that are being infected, and the extent of this disease on the population. <clears throat> Another important use of epidemiology inquiry is to study the natural progression of a disease. So um, what is the incubation period? Is somebody contagious during their incubation period. What are the first signs and symptoms? How does it develop in a human? And what is the ultimate end result of the population with and without some type of intervention that is put into place? So as you can see, um, Ebola has a really high mortality rate. So it's highly infectable. People who are exposed to it uh, are people who are exposed to the disease are likely to be infected by it. It has a high pathogenicity, which means that if you're exposed to it, the chances that you'll develop symptoms are really high. Unlike something like the flu, which has a pretty good infectability, if you're exposed to it, you'll probably inf be infected but it has a low pathogenicity if you have been vaccinated, which means you can be exposed to it, you can be infected by it, but never develop the symptoms. You won't have that pathogenicity. And then does it lead to death or not? And so as you can see with Ebola, it has like an 80 or 90% um, death rate. So it studies the natural prognosis or progression of disease through history, through time, with and without interventions. And so by having this progression of the disease, more occurrences of it, and studying it in our occupational surveillance systems, we're able to help OSHA and help the researchers at NIOSH develop new standards or control me mechanisms to prevent um, these diseases from occurring in our population. For example, it was the high incident rates of occupational asthma studied early on in the 90s that led to the realization that exposure to isocyanates was bringing upon occupational as asthma and we needed to put stronger controls in place. And now bringing back to our current times, several epidemiological studies have identified inhalable crystalline silica as having potential um, carcinogenic effects and that led to the changes in our crystalline silica standard. So it's through these epidemiology that isn't just making an educated guess, but really studying populations who are exposed populations who aren't exposed, but yet these two populations are similar enough that we can be sure that it's the exposure that's causing their disease and not some other type of environmental exposure. So the fourth reason for epidemiology inquiry is to evaluate both existing and new preventative therapeutic measures and ways of which delivering health methods or delivering care to people. This is where we use it in industrial hygiene and 
safety is to evaluate whether our controls are working or not. And the fifth purpose for epidemiology inquiry is to provide a, that foundation for public policy and regulatory decisions. Why are your children vaccinated against measles, mumps, and rubella before they go to school? Well, that was a policy that was put into place after studying the effects of vaccines and the lower contractile rates of these uh, really detrimental diseases in our populations. We also set action limits and change occupational exposure limits. So this is our epidemiology is the foundation for our public policies. So a little history here and to relate back to the history lesson, I'm gonna play a short video for you because it's really interesting. If you have the time to read um, the visual explanation of the Jon Snow story, I urge you to do that because it's really quite um, interesting to be able to read that. So I'm going to go through and show you a little video to talk about the historical context of epidemiology. This is one of the most famous landmarks in London medical history. Um, this pump right here. We're on uh, Broadwick Street in Soho, which in 1854 was Broad Street, in the middle of the slums and rookeries which constituted Soho at that time. And on the 8th of September, 1854, uh, on the instructions of the Dr. John Snow, the handle to this pump was removed so that water could no longer be drawn from it because Snow had recognised that this pump, the water from this pump, was the source of the outbreak of cholera that had been ravaging Soho, killing over 500 people in the previous weeks. Cholera had first arrived in London in 1831. It had swept across from Asia. It was an absolutely terrifying disease, very, very rapid in its progress, very indiscriminate in who it attacked and um, cholera epidemics were brief but extremely intense. Cholera was a horrifying disease with incredibly rapid onsets. The first thing you knew about it was terrible stomach cramps and um, diarrhoea, and then you'd um, quite often die often the same day just in a pool of your own stinking excrement. The prevailing theory at the time was that um, filth diseases like cholera, as they were called, infectious and contagious diseases, were spread by a general miasma, um, a general um, pollution of the atmosphere, which might sort of be, emanate from the ground or be part of the air or um, you know, be spread in any number of ways. People try and protect themselves against them by inhaling sweet-scented things and so on. Um, this was um, actually the framework within which Jon Snow himself was working. Um, it would be another generation before Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch and the idea that these diseases were actually spread by germs and bacteria. So Snow still believed that cholera was being communicated by a miasma, but he believed that the miasma was particularly concentrated in the water supply. So what's really interesting about what he said was that Snow wasn't using microbiology and he wasn't using toxicology. He didn't have a microscope available to him he was able to figure out that the water supply, or at least have a good hypothesis, that the water supply was causing cholera based on the concentration of deaths in certain areas and people that weren't developing cholera that were upstream versus a higher proportion of people who were developing cholera that were on the downstream side. So you can do a lot of good just using your descriptive statistics. And epidemiology does this in many ways. So this legendary moment is commemorated not only by this pump here, but also by a pub, the John Snow. So this is the John Snow. It's full of John Snow memorabilia. Um, and it even has a part of the legendary pump handle that was removed. It was only renamed the John Snow quite recently and it's a symbol I guess in that sense of um, how 
you know, yeah, the, the legend, legend of Jon Snow's story has grown with the years. And um, as is often the case with medical and scientific breakthroughs, the story that's accreted around it um, isn't quite, you know, not, nothing is quite as it seems and nothing is quite the way it was. Um, the site of the pump, um, for example, is not actually the site of the pump. The pump was uh, actually over here, much closer to the pub, a few yards down the road. The version of the Jon Snow story that we hear these days is that by removing the handle from the Broad Street pump, he saved countless lives in the middle of a cholera epidemic. That by identifying uh, the water in the pump as the cause of contagion, uh, he moved away from traditional theories of sort of miasma and kind of general pollution and towards modern theories of um, germs and bacteria and infection. And um, finally, that it was Jon Snow's work in this that became the main impetus for the extraordinary revolution in London's sanitation that would happen in the next decade with uh, Joseph Bazalgette's enormous project to remodel London's sewers. What was really original about Jon Snow's work, what was really groundbreaking, was the statistical method behind it. He started plotting the locations of all the deaths in the cholera epidemic, and he discovered that they all clustered around um, water pumps and particularly around this pump in Broad Street. He then investigated the people living in these slums around Broad Street and found that the people who were least affected were the brewery workers because they were drinking beer rather than water. So John Snow's statistical work was groundbreaking, but actually um, this great moment when the pump handle was taken off the pump had very little effect. It was largely symbolic because by the time he'd managed to persuade the parish to remove the pump handle, the cholera epidemic had pretty much burnt itself out anyway. So it's unlikely that he saved any lives. And also um, the idea which is frequently now attached to his story that this was a pivotal moment in uh, the campaign to um, revolutionize London sanitation is also unfortunately not true. Snow's report when he finally produced it, um, gathered very little attention at the time. But John Snow's work, as would be recognised with hindsight, was a very important contribution um, to a public health movement that had been building in London uh, since cholera had arrived in the early 1830s. So the real significance of John Snow's story is that it's the birth of epidemiology, it's the birth of statistical analysis, and it shows how many lives you can save and how much you can improve conditions with the proper statistical surveys. But of course, this is something we recognise clearly now, but wasn't recognised at the time. So uh, John Snow, although he went on and made other pioneering medical discoveries, never really lived to um, see his uh, work on the Broad Street pump come to any sort of practical fruition. But So what has happened in the last 100 years, as far as public health goes, one of the greatest outcomes is, of course, our expanded life expectancy, due in no small part to vaccinations and motor vehicle safety. So in 2013, the expected um, life expectancy was 78.7 years, where back in 1900, the average life expectancy was 47 years. So there are now 50,000 fewer cases of smallpox when compared to the 1900s, and 900,000 fewer cases of measles, 21 fewer cases of polio now than had occurred in 1951, and Americans, ha anyways, have a pretty good control on rubella, tetanus, and diphtheria. Uh, motor vehicle safety. Since 1925, the annual death rate for motor vehicle safety has decreased by 90%. Seatbelts save approximately 85,000 lives. Child safety seats have reduced the risk of infant death by 69%. And community awareness with driving while intoxicated regu regulations having decreased alcohol-related deaths by 32%. And this is using 1925 as our baseline. We've also controlled infectious diseases, such as cholera and typhoid. Um, since the 20th century, sanitation has been significantly improved in our developing countries. 
and there's been a decline from deaths of coronary heart disease and stroke, in part by being able to understand what the risk factors of diet and use of um, smoking have caused. Um, and we have more healthier babies and mothers when we realize that better hygiene, nutrition, and antibiotics have brought better neonatal care to everybody who's needed it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the material and now you can um, relate a little better to your first assignment.